All right. Brian Michael Smith, of course, from 911 Lone Star. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. Welcome to Everything Iconic. I was doing my research and we actually graduated from the same school. You graduated from Kent State University, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I graduated from Kent too. Um, and also from the video production program, I think around the same time, we might have like had a class together or something. Is that right? Do you know Mike Verratti? I mean, he's doing like similar things. I, we know, like, I know who he is, but I don't know. Yeah. What a small world. Oh my God. That's amazing. Yeah, I, man. I, did you remember Carl Eidsvug? This is sort of a... <laughs> I have nightmares fun. about him, Brian. What the heck? Oh my gosh. <laughs> him and Ron Thomas were just like the two guys that were just like, I can't, I just, I don't want to... Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's wild, man. No one's going to know what we're talking about. Yeah, but yeah I, I literally have nightmares about that man still to this day. Um, in the black world, man. I just, yeah. Yeah. Brian, talk to me about uh, 911 Lone Star. I love the show. I've been watching, uh, I've seen every episode. I love it. But tell me about the new season, about your role, all of that stuff. Um, I'm excited about the new season, the 911 Lone Star. We're picking up uh, into the quarantine. We're like, bring that into it. So you're seeing, like, you know, what have we been up to in the in the months since? Uh, you know, things kind of popped off. And, uh, you know, I, I thought that uh, because of the COVID protocols with production and whatnot, they're like, oh, man, they're going to probably scale things down until we can. They have not. So we have <laughs> bigger uh, emergencies that we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, everything is just as, as action oriented as possible. But what's been really cool is to see how we've been exploring the deepening relationships between uh, the characters on the show and how they've evolved, you know, over time, like because of because of COVID forcing us together or like just kind of upending our personal lives in ways. And you're kind of seeing how that's going to uh, play out over the season. So we got some new characters coming in that you didn't see before. We have some characters who um, are not going to be joining us again and just kind of like. Are we miss- we're not going to have Liv again, are we? Is Liv? No, no. Yeah. So Liv is I'm not. I'm going to miss Liv, Brian. Yeah, no, she was. I love she her. Was so fun to work with. Um, just as, as sweet as her voice, you know, and, and like, you know, it made everything like a, a good time. So we definitely miss her in, in the in the production. And, uh, you know, the door is open for her character. So, you know, so that that that's a plus. Yeah. Um, so hopefully but, she'll, we'll get her back at some point. Hopefully she'll pop you know, back in. It's 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 uh, the Tim Minear Rashad world. Things can happen if we can have a volcano in Austin. I think we can get some more Michelle Blake. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing from last season was just she'd be delivering these like very intense lines, but she has like you said the sweetest voice ever, and it was yes. just I I loved it. I loved the sort of dichotomy of it. Yes, it just just throw it off because it's like you know you got uh, us coming in. It's all testosterone. Like let's go. We got this. We got this, Captain. If you <laughs> give this child, the- I'm like, yeah, you it tell will. him. You tell him. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever see her open? I'm sorry to make this about Liv Tyler now, but did you see her Architectural Digest open tour? Um, it's like a tour of her house. It's Brian, just go check it out. It's the best thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Okay, I'm doing it. I'm creeping in her house. I need to know what's going on over there. Okay, so your character. What's to come for your character specifically? Uh, so Paul, you were getting to know a little bit more about Paul and seeing him open up, which has been great. Uh, uh, in the first season, you know, he was still feeling everything out, you know, and like, you know, kind of getting to know people. He's a man of few, uh, a few words. Um, I feel like this season he's opening up a bit more. So you're getting to see a little bit more about his humor. You're getting to see a little bit more about his relationship with, uh, with his comrades. And you get to know a little bit more about his family and, uh, and his backstory, which I think is going to be interesting. And f- uh, forgive me if I get this wrong, but it, it's the first trans black char- uh, series regular on network TV, right? Black trans masculine character on network TV. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so have you heard from a lot of uh, trans youths and, and, and people and what's I that have, been like? I have, I've kept my, um, my DM opens for that specific reason. I work at the, uh, the LGBT center in Manhattan in their youth program. And it was an experience for me that let me know just how important it is to be accessible for young people or people who are not necessarily young chronologically, but maybe young in their relationship to their identity and their truth and how much of a difference it makes to have a real person to be able to see a real person doing things that you would want to do for yourself and to be able to like talk to them, you know, either for encouragement or, you know, to ask questions and things like that. So I've had a lot of young people uh, reach out to me and either just, you know, let, let them know how much my character, my work has meant to them, or just how much me as an individual kind of 
putting myself out there and, and, and going after my dreams uh, has, has meant to them. And that's been amazing. And our, like having parents talk to me about how they've been able to under, have more understanding for their child and stick up for their child when they're facing discrimination in school and their community, because they realize that, you know, a lot of it is fear-based and they don't have to be as afraid of their child not having a future as they were before. You know, like we still have to deal with uh, bullying and violence and the threat of, of violence for sure. But, you know, just knowing that, there is a path for them into adulthood, you know, goes, goes a long way. So profound to me. Yeah. I mean, I think about, I think about that time at Kent state and I, you know, I'm a, a gay man and I think about representation when I was in college or in high school and there wasn't much of it. And it's so incredibly important for kids to be able to see themselves on screen in all sorts of different roles mm-hmm. because it lets them know that there is that future. And yeah. It, yeah. It's yeah. Amazing. I mean, Growing up in, in, you know, in the Midwest and not seeing anybody like me made me think that I was the only one like me. Mm -hmm. And that was so isolated. So even though I was gregarious, I was trying all these things to connect and be around people. You know, I just felt this difference that I felt like was going to get in the way or like stop me from doing what I really want to do. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I, you know, realized that, okay, I can be who I, I want to be, but that might mean I have to sacrifice what I really want to do. So then for like my mid twenties, I was doing that. I was doing all this acting adjacent work because I thought if I'm going to be who I am, then I, I'm not going to be able to do that. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't until I saw Laverne Cox in my thirties, you know, that I realized I can be who I am and do what I want to do. Right. And I'm going to do that, you know? You mentioned Laverne and I, one of my favorite documentaries of the past, I don't know how long was Disclosure on Netflix. It was, if, if anyone hasn't watched it, immediately go to Netflix and watch it. You were one of the talking heads in it. And it was such a important piece to just show, in, speaking of representation, how far we've come, but also how far we still have to go. And, um, you know, one of the things that struck me and it's, it's kind of gone viral, Jen Richards is talking about specifically Eddie Redmayne. Um, I forget the name of the movie, uh, where he plays a trans woman. What, what did you, the Danish girl? Yes. Yes. That's it. There's a clip that sort of went viral of Jen talking about that performance and how it's so important to have trans people in trans roles. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. Well, the reason why it's important to have trans people in trans roles is this association that people have that trans people aren't real, that trans people are men who dress up like women or women who dress up like men. And when you have a male actor playing a trans female character um, and then they show up in the interviews and on the red carpet and, you know, peeled and just in their tuxedos and like, you know, see, it was a man. It reinforces that idea. And people respond with violence to that idea, you know, when they are dealing with real trans people in the real world, because they have that association that you're just a man in a dress or you're just a woman who's dressing like a man. And they they, they have this, you know, visceral response to that. And just um, if we can show that trans people are real people who exist, not just in the character on the screen, but then also outside of that fictional space that they exist in real life and that they're real functioning human people as well. Um, it starts to diminish that association and you get to start to realize that, Oh, trans people do exist and they have always existed and they're going to continue to exist. And they are going about their lives and their daily business. And it is not impacting me in the way that I've been coached to fear it's going to impact me. Right. You know, so you have people who feel like they need to enforce and support, you know, bathroom bills and locker room bills and keep, you know, trans people out of sports because of this idea that keeps getting reinforced whenever you see a man playing a trans woman. Right. You know, I always think about people who are sort of breaking the glass ceiling or, or uh, you know, with the pressure that comes with that, because you know, here I am, I'm interviewing you and I'm asking you these, these questions that are very large, heavy questions. And I wonder um, um, the emotional toll that must take to always have to, or to always be asked stuff like that. Does that make sense? It does. And I feel like it, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of trans actors who are not out, you know, for that specific reason, not because they have any shame about who they are, or, you know, even a fear of a limiting of, of a, access to opportunities. They just don't want to do that educational labor. Um, And, you know, 
most of the interviews, you know, I do get a chance to talk about the work sometimes, but then a lot of the conversation will go to, you know, the impact and, you know, being trans. But for me, I consciously made a decision to do that. Like I, I consciously made a decision to, you know, to be publicly visible in this way so that I can have these conversations that I can be, I can take the pressure off the people who don't necessarily want to have those conversations. Cause I'll do that. Just like I will, I decided to use my art, you know, as my activism, as opposed to, you know, some of the other uh, activists who, you know, like Trace, Chase Strangio has worked for the ACLU and is actually going into the Supreme Court and, you know, challenging, you know, anti-trans legislation or, you know, people who are uh, going into the street and organizing um, the community and organizing community uh, demonstrations. Like everybody sort of picks their lane. And as someone who, um, you know, uh, worked at the LGBT community center, did community organizing and, you know, I'm comfortable having the conversation and kind of tries to stay abreast of um what's happening within the community and what information I feel like needs to get out. I'm okay with, with, with having the, those conversations. Well, you know? thank you. I like I, they to, yeah. They need to be had. I, I think it's so important. And also I just am so grateful to people like you who are willing to openly talk about it because again, it's emotionally exhausting to have these conversations and, and you know, there's certain people who have broken glass ceilings who are constantly called on to have these heavy conversations. Mm-hmm. And so I, I thank you. Yeah. Uh, Brian, what's next for you? What What are your aspirations outside of nine one one Lone Star? Like, what What's next, or what do you hope for? Well, you know, I was hoping uh, to start getting to some films when we go into the hiatus. Like, I I love doing uh, the action uh, on uh, on Lone Star, and you know, somebody who grew up eating, you know, just action TV shows and and uh, and films, and just watching like so much. There's a lot of things that's like, okay, now I feel like I, I you know, I, I want to do that. So if I had my way, I would do a trifecta of uh, of action type movies. I would do a disaster film, I would do a war movie, and uh, I would do a western. Oh, we need that, Brian. Yes. I yes. find that's one of the things I'm not normally an action guy, but I'm like watching 911 Lone Star and I'm loving it. There's so many hot people on it in general. Like every all of you guys are like gore, everyone's gorgeous. I love going to work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. oh my God, like that cat. What's it like working with Rob Lowe? Is is he a nice guy? Do you like he him? He is a nice guy. Like, you know, he's he's one of these people you can tell it's like they've been in the industry for a long time. They know how things are supposed to go and they're gonna make sure that things go in that way. But he also loves what he does. So there's a joy that he kind of brings to work too because it's like you know he enjoyed he enjoys it and he's done tv a lot but i think this is his first like lead vehicle and so i think he's like you know in, enjoying that and like you know bringing that to work so it's been really fun to like you know to talk to him uh watch what he like i learned a lot from him just from watching him like work and like you know how he works with the cameras and um finds the the angles and whatnot or you know finds like you know, if he can take a scene, like it, on the page, it looks great. It's it, in rehearsal. It's great. And then like, you know, he'll find a moment. It's like, this is what's going to take it to that, you know? And it, like, it's, 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 uh, it's like watching a masterclass sometimes. So that's been fun. I listen. I, I'm a huge Martin short fan and he had Martin short on his podcast. I listened to it. It was so funny to just hear them talk about stories from throughout the years of Hollywood. And that's like, they yeah. worked with every, you forget kind of some of these people have worked with everyone and yeah. Uh, yeah, Brian, no, no, kind of, he has so many. He has stories. I tell you, man, literally about almost everybody. So that's been fun too. Like getting them on like Hollywood history lessons whenever yeah. I go to work. What kind of stuff do you like? What's your favorite movie? Do you have like a couple movies that are your go-to? You mentioned you love the action genre. Is there like one or two movies you won't stop if you're flipping through channels? You know, I'm like, uh, I love Titanic. Titanic, I think, is one of those like secret engines that really propelled me to go after it because it was one of the most transformative experiences I've had in a movie theater where like it just took me somewhere. I'm like, I love that. Um, and the first and, time I ever saw Titanic was on VHS. Remember, they had to put it in two tapes? VHS. Yeah. I pre ordered those two <laughs> tapes and I, I think I had to go pick it up at Sam Goody or some shit. And it, the old world <laughs> that was like yes. two VHS tapes. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I love I like I, like Titanic. I absolutely love I love Interstellar. I could watch that and Black Panther. I could just I, it's another one of those things that just I feel like it, it, I go to Wakanda every time I do it. You know what I mean? Right, Brian. We need to see you in a Marvel movie. I prefer. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for taking the time. I look forward to watching the premiere of Nine One One Lone Star. Where can people find you on social media? They can find me at the Brian Michael on Twitter and at the underscore Brian Michael on Instagram. Thank you so much, Brian, for taking the time and congrats on all the success. And hopefully we'll meet in person sometime. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. Bye-bye.